agricultural comparison and management focus on China, with the rapid rise of multinational companies around the world, and uh, we have seen that intercultural elements have been playing a more and more important role in the world economy. That's why we feel the necessity to offer this course. Throughout this course, we are going to compare the Chinese culture with other countries' cultures in management practices. So here is the agenda for today's session. We are going to look at a course overview and then we will discuss the dimensions of culture. And in the end, we will look at the role of culture in management practice. So by the end of this class, you will be able to understand the structure of the whole course and get familiar with the three dimensions of culture and then understand the relations of culture and management. All of this will be done on the emphasis of China. Okay, we'll move to the first section of introduction. We have two questions here. The first question is, why cross-cultural components in management matters? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, very few people were very concerned about the intercultural components in management. But nowadays, more and more people are aware of the importance of the intercultural comparison in management practices. So how do you think about this issue? Why is it becoming so important at present? Who would like to start? Why are we going to learn these intercultural elements in management? Please. Okay, I, I think uh, in the past, like the business language was English. Mm -hmm. So, with the rise of Japan and then part of Europe, which is mm -hmm. West Europe, mm -hmm. and then China, mm -hmm. then now it becomes a mix of languages. Mm -hmm. So, one thing has to take that aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, global economy was developing, and we had a mixed team of companies doing business uh, in different countries. Very good. Anything else? So how about you think about that as a future manager? What would your team be? 20 years ago, for example, if you worked for a company in your home country, maybe your team would be all from the same culture, the same country. And how, how is it going to be? in the next 10 years, or even now? What do you think of this? As a future manager, what would your team be? What would your expectation be about the team that you are going to manage? So, probably they will be the people from different cultures, right? Mm -hmm from an international context and it would be useful for you to know more about their cultures so that would be more useful for you to manage it more effectively okay so next question is why Chinese culture matters? because China is getting stronger mm -hmm. because the Chinese economic power is getting stronger very good, anything else? The Chinese market is big and the purchasing power is getting higher. Yeah. And also, it's because of the uniqueness of the Chinese culture. Chinese culture is dramatically different from many other cultures. So before you get to know about Chinese culture, maybe you have no idea why people behave like this. What is the signal they're trying to convey to me? So as long as you have some knowledge about the Chinese culture, it's more likely that you will do business in China or you will deal with Chinese companies more successfully. Okay. Then, in this course, we're going to introduce the first part series. 
And the second part, culture and organizations. And the third part is culture and communication. And then we'll analyze some case studies throughout the whole course. Okay. Now we come to the part of dimensions of culture, three levels. So how do we define culture? How does culture operate? If we assume that this culture is a C, we call it the cultural C, we can divide this C into three levels. If this is a cultural C, we have three layers or three levels. One, two, three. And at the first level, we have behavior. At this level, it's like when you come to a foreign country for the first time, what you can observe immediately. What differences you will discover in this foreign country? What surprises you or what astonishes you even? So that can be achieved by observation. So this is the explicit level. For example, it can be observed in terms of architecture, rituals, dress codes, language, food, and so on. Okay, I'll give you an example. Chinese architecture style. So this is different from that in the Western countries. So the special roof, the special structure and orientation. So this is the forbidden city. And then in the ancient times, the traditional or perfect Chinese house was like a mini world. They had all the pavilions, a river, trees and flowers, all set in the uh, small space. So it was not the same in the Western country. They had a mansion, but the mansion was not like a mini world. So this is traditional Chinese style. And also, you have learned some Chinese characters. The many foreigners think that every Chinese character is like a drawing and some of them represent the physical objects or the shapes. So, could you tell me what's this character? This one? Yeah. Yeah. It means the sun. The sun. <coughs> so it looks like the sun. So it originated from this one to this one. And how about this one? Yeah. yeah, means the moon. Good. And this one? Huo. It means the fire. So it looks like the fire in this shape. Okay, this is. Do you recognize this one? Can you recognize this? Nan. Nan. <laughs> what does this mean? Male. Male. Or a man. The upper part means the farm work, tian, and the lower part is labor. So, in ancient China, a man was supposed to do the farm work. So, it, he was the labor in the farm work. So, it has special meaning. Okay, now we have this question. Please give an example at the cultural behavior level that you observe in China, such as food, language, houses, habits, dress codes, how people speak and act, any example that you can give and you find interesting. Skipping. Sorry? <laughs> Spitting. <laughs> yeah. That is something we're trying to improve. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I want to set an example about the uh, <coughs> people who want to express something and mm -hmm. maybe use a twist way, not the straight way. Mm -hmm. So when they speak, mm -hmm. you have to guess. Yeah. Uh, the same as in Japan. You guess a lot. Yeah. Anything else? How do you say hi to each other when you jump into a friend in the street in your home country? Shaking hands, or by kissing, or 
A hug will be given to a friend. But in China, you wouldn't say people hugging in the streets. Yeah. Okay, anything else? The food. How do you feel about Chinese food? Yeah, maybe it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Anything else? The taste? Do you like the taste? Quite different mm -hmm. from the European mm -hmm. style. Mm -hmm. Because uh, within European, mm -hmm. um, people uh, don't consume uh, much rice mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. in China. But here, rice is yeah. the yeah. main food. Yes. Yeah. And also, uh, in different regions of China, they also eat different kinds of food. Like in Sichuan province, the food is very spicy. Do you know why? Because the weather is too humid, and they they need to eat some spicy food, like to remove the humid stuff from the body. But in the northeast China, we don't eat much spicy food traditionally. Okay, good. So this is the first level we talked about. By observation, we could see the first layer of the culture behavior. And then we'll move or we'll swim to the middle level, the second level, beliefs and values. So this is something you cannot notice immediately, but you can get to know this by interviews by interviews and surveys. So this level is apparently deeper than the first level. For example, the rules of a society, characteristics of a culture, and how to determine what is good or bad with regard to behavior. We can ask the question, if this behavior is right or wrong according to the value systems of this culture, if this is considered to be important or unimportant according to a specific culture. The next discussion question is, according to what you observed and learned, what do you think is the right attitude from the Chinese perspective for a student to treat his or her teacher in China. Because this is very different from how it is in Western countries and in many other countries. Maybe in Asian countries we share the similar value in terms of this, but in other countries it's a different case. So no matter if it's similar with how it is at your home country, could you describe what do you think is the right attitude towards a teacher in China? Please. Actually, I think in China, students cannot uh, suspect the teachers. And no matter if the teacher is right or wrong, mm -hmm. uh, especially so in some instances, teacher may be uh, expect uh, 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 questions on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some um, mistakes mm -hmm. or some mistake, uh, special mistakes mm -hmm. that students cannot uh, point out. Mm -hmm. What if, for example, what if I said something wrong and the student just stood up in the classroom saying, you are wrong. What would you think? I would think. I would feel about this student. This is rude. This is rude. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would think this is rude. And disrespect. Disrespect. So I would take it personally. I wouldn't take it as it, it, it's according to what I, I'm teaching. I would think this is towards myself. So that's, that's something that makes me lose face. In China, teachers would think like that. So they wouldn't like it. So that is the value system and the beliefs according to the culture. But in the Western countries, so students and teachers... Order 
to do your work. But you are from a low action is much better in classrooms, and that's why. Okay, this is the second level. At the second level, by interviews and the surveys, we could get to know the beliefs and the values of a culture. And then we move to the deepest level, the uttermost level, called uh, basic assumptions. So this level is the deepest, yet the most interesting one. Why? Because it's very difficult to explore and it can only be construed through interpretation of what is happening at the other two levels. We could only interpret it. So sometimes when you ask someone a question, they would, they would answer like, I have never thought about this question. Why is it this way? I don't know. It's just because we always do it in this way. So this is most likely to be a question at this level. For example, this is a question. Why do Chinese, Japanese and the Korean chopsticks differ? Have you ever noticed that? No. <laughs> most people do not notice that. Okay. The upper pair are Japanese style chopsticks. They are short and made of wood. The middle pair are Korean chopsticks. They are made of metal. And the lower pair are Chinese style chopsticks. They are long and made of sometimes wood, sometimes bamboo. Mm -hmm. But they differ. Why? So this question is at this level of basic assumptions. People never thought about this, and they wouldn't be able to answer why. But if you ask them, they have to try to answer them through the interpretations from other levels, and they try to analyze why. So the answer is not apparent. You have to explain, try to explain. But some people try to explain, and now I will try to explain. The Japanese chopsticks are short because in Japan, people eat individual meal. They don't share a table of dishes with each other, like what it is in China. So the chopsticks are short. And in Korea, they eat a lot of barbecue food, roasted meat. So if they use uh, wood or bamboo chopsticks, they easily get burnt, so they change the materials to metal. And in China, especially in Asian China, the longer the chopsticks were, the richer the family was, because they had a lot of dishes, and if you had long chopsticks, it could be easy to pick up the food further. <laughs> so that is why. So it's at the deepest level, so you could only interpret it from uh, the other levels, and then you could get an answer. But maybe different people have different explanations for the same question. And so this is the whole picture, the big picture of the cultural sea. So when we observe a culture, imagine that we are like the fishes swimming through the sea, and the, at the first level, we could observe the behavior, and at the second level, we could achieve the knowledge of beliefs and the values of this culture by interviews and surveys. And at the deepest level, we could have some basic assumptions of this culture by interpretation. So this is the second part regarding dimensions of culture, or we also call it three layers of a culture. Okay, then we're going to learn the last part of this session, culture and the management. So we could have some cultural assumptions in management because culture has a heavy influence in how this company is operated, how the management style is going to be. For example, to what extent 
does management within a culture assume that it can control nature? Or are relationships at work more important than the task itself? Such as in Japan, people don't differentiate work relationships with personal relationships. So they mix them together. But in Western countries, they separate them very distinctly. So the work relationships are based on contracts. Okay, the, set, the, the, the other question is like, are humans basically assumed to be good or evil? According to Confucian teaching, do you know that people are born to be good or bad? According to Confucian teaching, good or bad? Good. <laughs> that's, the, that's how the teaching is. According to Confucian teaching, people are born to be good. But according to the uh, Christian, doctrine, people are born to have original sin, right? So that is the different assumption from the Chinese culture. So at the deepest level we have some assumptions and these cultural factors effectively, effectively affect the management in the business context. So this was a research conducted by Gordon Redding in 1990, he researched about how Chinese run their businesses abroad. So according to the findings, Chinese companies owned by the family and usually run by one dominant family member overseas. And the companies are usually kept small to enable the family control. And if there is any cooperation, that is to cooperate with other companies through a network of personal relations, such as family members, extension of family members, or acquaintances, friends, within the Chinese population. So this is how the Chinese run their businesses overseas. So you could pay attention to run by one dominant family member and companies are kept small to enable the family control. Now we have a lot of small and medium companies in the richest provinces like in Zhejiang or Jiangsu. Some of them are struggling with this issue if they should expand the company because they don't really trust outsiders. They want to keep the control within the family. But one other issue is that the trend is to internationalize or, or enlarge the company or the businesses. So they don't know what to do. Some factory owners, some company owners are still confused about what they should do. If they should employ an outsider as a CEO to operate this company, but I don't really trust him. I want my son to take over my company, but my son is not interested. What should I do? So this is still an issue for Chinese company owners because of the cultural factors. So this is inside this guanxi, this network. So they don't really want to like delegate or trust outsiders. Okay, there are several factors we could pay attention to according to culture and management. The first one is national culture, including the physical environment of this country and the history the nation has undergone. And the organizational culture. How cultural elements affect the way strategy is determined, goals are established and how the organization operates. And the last one, individuals' culture. Because all in all, companies are run by individuals. So the way how individuals behave can influence how this company is managed. So it is to take into account the diversity of people in the organization and to manage their cultural differences. And also the importance of cross-cultural management in the international context. Okay, now I will 
introduce a selected part of Hofstede's dimensions and try to apply it to the case of China. Hofstede's dimensions is almost the most well-known theory about culture in management and uh, uh, there are five dimensions of the theory including power distance, high or low, individual versus group orientation, masculine versus feminine orientation, uncertainty avoidance, short-term versus long-term orientation. And the fifth dimension, short-term versus long-term orientation was inspired by the Confucian teaching. But today we'll focus on the first one and we'll uh, learn the next four dimensions in the coming sessions. Power distance, high or low. What does power distance mean in Hofstede's theory? So they are the attitudes to authority, the distance between individuals in a hierarchy. Okay, in details, it could include such factors. In terms of organizational structure, in a low power distance country, it is relatively flat. So we don't have like many levels in the organization. But in a high power distance country, so we have this hierarchical pyramid. In terms of status symbols, low power distance country is relatively unimportant. But in the high uh, power distance country, it is considered to be very important. Regarding importance of face, so in a low power distance country, the managers think face saving is less important compared to in a high power distance country. And according to participative management, in a low power distance country, this is possible. Like the managers are consultative, you could come to me and discuss with me how this work can be done. You don't only just receive orders and listen to me. But in a high power distance country, it's almost not impossible. You should do what I tell you to do. And in terms of the role of manager, in a low power distance country, the managers are acting like the facilitator. And in a high power distance country, they are more like the experts. So what they say should be regarded to be right or correct. Okay, so let's think about these questions. The first one, let's reduce it to a simple level. The dress code, how people dress. In a high power distance country, so the managers or the high level people always dress very formally with suits and tie, such as in China, if you see a high level government officials, they always present himself like in a very formal way. But in the US, it is a typical low power distance country. So executives or even leaders can present himself with a very casual image. Like Obama could play basketball in the yard of the White House and Steve Jobs was actually a tyrant, so he always presented the image with t-shirts and jeans. So this is the cultural difference. So my question is, if, okay, if you are from a high power distance country, and you are my boss, and you come to work in shoes and a tie, and I am from a low power distance country, and I come to work in t-shirt and jeans, how would you think about me? How would you feel about me? Dressing very casually? Not serious, not serious enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? You think I'm not serious enough? Not me. I don't respect you, right? I cannot trust you. You cannot trust me. This is the point. You cannot even trust me if I, <laughs> if I wear a t-shirt. So that, that is essential then, at work. So you will think I'm irresponsible. Probably I will be irresponsible about the work, about my job. Yeah. And, uh, okay. What if um, I am from, uh, I am from a, 
a high power distance country and I'm your subordinate and I come to work in suits and tie and you are my boss and you come to work like in shabby pants and just a, a, a t-shirt with prints in front of you. So what, what, what would I think of you? Think. My boss comes to work in the party way. How would I think about you? Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah, that might be. Yeah. Anything else negative? Could I trust you? <laughs> In question. Yeah. Maybe I would say. Yeah. Especially thinking that he doesn't really care for the company's image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think about that. He, re he doesn't really care about his work. How could he be the boss? Yeah, I would have the you doubt. You can't say that. I'm supposed to be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think about that. <laughs> Good. So that is the, the culture difference. Okay, another question like. Um, if I am your boss still, and I'm from a high uh, power distance country, and uh, according to my culture, I just give you some order to do your work. But you are from a low power distance country. I tell you, okay, do this and do that. What would you think? How would you respond? Who am I? Okay. And, and then? Further control. from that, too much control. Too much control. Dissatisfaction. You may think I don't respect you. Yeah. And what would you say to me? Let's imagine the scenario. I tell you, do this and do that. Do Firstly, do this and secondly, do that. You don't need to tell me. Uh huh. You don't need to tell me that. Yeah. Okay. And you might ask why, right? Yeah. So what does it mean when you ask why? You may think you give me more information than I can know what I should do. So don't just tell me what to do. Good. So that is what I would think, and you would think, and what I would think. I mean, if you just refuse to take my order, what would I think as a boss? <laughs> I might fire you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you could see the psychological state of people from different power distance countries. If you are from if you are from a high power distance country and you are my subordinate, I'm your boss. I'm from a low power distance country. And you are supposed to hear what I order you to do. But I just, I just say, uh, I cannot tell you what you should do. Come to my office and at least let's discuss this. Let's uh, develop a strategy together. What would you think of me? Open. Open, yeah. And, uh, and? But you used to like taking orders. But then here comes the boss saying, I won't order you to do anything. You just come to consult with me and then we can just discuss something together. What would you think of me? Maybe you are losing your job soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I, I'm not that capable of, of, yeah. of taking this job. Yeah. Anything else? I think the, the boss uh, one creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you may not get used to this way I manage this company, but maybe on the other hand, you would think this is a good thing that I have more freedom and space to, to do my work. Yeah. More discretion. So, could you give me an, an example to your home country? Uh, do you define your home country as a high power distance country? or low power distance country and give me an example. Think about this. Firstly, introduce which country you're from and then it's a more 
high power distance country or low power distance country and give me an example. Yeah, please. Okay, I'll say, okay, I'm from Kenya. Kenya. And uh, I'll say Kenya is kind of low power. Low power distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, like, uh, we don't have this system of giving everyone, like, do that, do this. Mm -hmm. I give you your office, I give you your target, it's up to you to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Bosses don't tell the subordinates how to do the job. Mm -hmm. I just give you the guidelines, maybe what you need to do this place is this. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, okay, by the end of the week, it's up to you to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You can start from the first or the last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but here in China, actually, I've noticed this. Yeah, about, how, how do you feel about China then? It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> you, you're a student. You, you. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, people judge you by how you look or maybe how you came in class. Mm -hmm. Seriousness doesn't mean you are in a suit. Mm -hmm. yeah. But here is kind of everything is systematic. Mm -hmm. And the way you talk to people, you start from somewhere. Like, if you want to do, let's say you want to see someone in the office, mm -hmm. you have to start from very low. Uh -huh. to do that process. Uh -huh. And actually, the issue is desperate to give them a uh -huh. So, so would, what would that be in your home country? So you just go straight to that higher it's office? And, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So you don't, come, you don't feel comfortable yeah. about this system? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Please try something. Yeah. How about Turkey? Um. Actually, it depends. Mm -hmm. So, business to business, in mm -hmm. uh, some um, business places you have to be your suite, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, high hierarchy. Mm -hmm. We don't need business area, but um, on the other hand, there are some other businesses mm -hmm. activities where you can be. Cool, I mean, not mm -hmm. high hierarchy, so mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be more responsible to your boss, mm -hmm. and you can just do whatever you want, but of course you have to follow your guideline, mm -hmm. your works, mm -hmm. but you can do this job. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the location and the companies, yeah. And in Europe, uh, France is a high power distance country relative to other European countries. And the US is the most typical low power distance country in the world. Yeah. Who would like to talk about that further? About your home country? In China you have something like performance appraisals. Mm -hmm. You have that? Yeah. I mean, admin staff have then the how, annual how performance appraisal because they uh, like they send forms yeah. to the other staffs and then let them evaluate one specific staff member mm -hmm. and then they will collect the data and then give some kind of marks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. For us, you suck yourself actually. We give you a performance appraisal mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. You write what you think you're capable of. Uh -huh. Then at the end of the day, if you have not achieved, we ask you please, you start yourself go home. Uh -huh. yeah. Yourself, you're not going to go home, you just decide this, you didn't achieve it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that is a good like point Yeah. about the differences. And anyone else? How about the Asian students? Is it similar <laughs> <laughs> as in China, <laughs> as your home country? Well, I'm from Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. so I'll say it's a low power distance. Low power distance. Because it doesn't matter if it's a CEO of a country or it's a, of a company or it's an employee. Mm -hmm. We have a traditional dressing of, maybe you have noticed it's a complete white dress mm -hmm. and with some hat kind of thing. Yeah. And everybody wears that same thing mm -hmm. and they come to office in the same way. Mm -hmm. And even the managements are always open for suggestions. Mm -hmm. For the meetings, they have normal staff, they have management, they have shareholders. They sit on the same table and discuss stuff. Mm -hmm. well, I believe it's also a low power distance. A low power distance is the collaborative <coughs> way to manage a company. Good, thank you. Okay, so we could analyze a country or a company from the different 
perspectives, as the organizational structures, status symbols, importance of face, participative management, and role of manager. So, uh, how would you think about this face issue in China? What is your impression about this face issue in China then? Like having, uh, you know, something when you go with people. Uh -huh. And then it's uh, a sitting arrangement, maybe the, the father is here, the brother has mm -hmm. Then you just came in and sat somewhere. Uh -huh. and, okay, you should be this way, it's not this way. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> was it a bad experience? Well, to me, to me, I came to know later after having had dinner, I was told that's not the way they should be done. They should wait until you're told to like. The way it was like really bad, but to them it seemed like it was something big. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, can I have a pause because I, I want to show them uh, another slide about the organizational structure. Um, so just thought about this. organizational structure I want to show you and you could see this is the typical Chinese organization structure there are many organization levels so we have this pyramid of a hierarchy and you could see this is a high power distance country and this is the American organization structure and everyone can argue with everyone in the company so it's a very democratic and consultative organization culture. Yeah. So that could give some hints about the cultural factors in management. And this is the Arab one. You can see that this must be a low power distance country. <laughs> Okay then, so uh, in this session, we looked at the whole structure of the course and we explored the three dimensions of culture, the three layers of culture. At the first level, we could observe behavior by observation. At the second level, we could uh, have some uh, knowledge about this culture's beliefs and values by interviews and surveys. And at the deepest and uttermost level, we could have the basic assumptions about this culture by interpretation. And then we discussed the culture and the management. We also looked at some parts of Hofstede's theory in culture and the management and tried to apply it to China. And we focused on the high and low power distance issue. And we would continue with the other four dimensions of Hofstede's theory in the next session. Thank you very much.